Okay, so. All right, I'm so I'm gonna take this from the top. My apologies. You couldn't see that. I did not know the software would not allow me to do what I just did. Okay. But basically, I've got this one photograph on this my comp. And the effects drop down menu is effects. And as you can see, there's the 3D channel, audio, blur and sharpen channel, and all the other groupings with their various pop-outs of different filters. This is one method to get to the filters. The second method is here on the right hand side. Let's see if I can. Whoa. No, that was no good. Ah. Am I making you dizzy yet? Probably am. Let's come out of that just a little bit. Okay. That was probably not a good idea. On the right hand side here, we have effects and presets. And you can see that they have the 3D channel, audio, blur, sharpen. This is an exact duplicate of what you see over on the other side. But the advantage of these effects and presets is the search bar at the top where you can type in, say, I want to find something like a filter that'll do rain. And it will go there and look for everything that has something that has the word rain in it. You know, spin, glow, much easier to find things. So it doesn't really matter whether you use this drop down me method or the right hand side panel. Both will work for you. Okay. Now let's start with just doing something real simple. On my P on my PowerPoint, you saw said that saw that I had put some filters start blank. So for example, if you were to go effects, blur and sharpen. Just do a simple box blur. It looks like nothing's happening. Well, several things have actually happened. Okay. First and foremost, down below on our bottom timeline, we now have a new option besides the transforms, which is the effects, which is our box blur, and all the options to deal with it. However, this information has been duplicated in the upper right hand corner because we do get a new panel up here. Stretch this out a little bit. So you can see that there's actually two tabs here, the project window and now the effects control tab up at the top. The effects control tab allows us to access this information without having to open up and hit all the little triangles here, which is a real pain in the neck uh, to do our filters. Now looking in the upper right hand corner, you'll see that the blur radius is actually set to zero. And this is what I mean by when you put filters on the screen, about, I don't know, a third to a half of them, I've never counted, actually are set to the zero position, meaning nothing happens. Now, if I want a blur, I just have to increase the amount of the blur. And as you can see, as I increase the amount, I get a bigger and bigger blur. We. Point it probably blurs totally out of sight. I also get this other option here for the box blur of iterations of how many times I want it to try to repeat the blur, which is not very handy. But I also get another option down below called blur dimensions. Right now it's blurring both in horizontal and vertical. I can set that actually to horizontal or to just vertical, which gives me a different, different, very different look than the first one. The real power of filters is not just what they do, but also the fact that each one of them has a stopwatch for almost every single option. So therefore I could stopwatch my radial blur at zero, move over two seconds and increase that. And now I've made an animation of going from blurry, go a few more seconds and then I can unblur it just as easily. So now my Goes blurry, unblurry, back and forth. Now the blurs themselves tend to be very, very simple um, filters. There's really not a lot of options here. If I want to get rid of those keyframes, I just hit the stopwatch a second time and the stopwatch is done. Okay, before I go racing ahead, 
why don't you guys, if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the chat so far. By the way, thank you very much for letting me know that you couldn't see my screen. I deeply appreciate that. Okay. Not seeing anybody coming up with a question, which is fine. We will continue on then. Now, the thing with filters is you can have as many filters as you want onto any single uh, layer. Now, to get rid of a filter, you can also hit the name and hit delete. Or if you just want to turn off the filter, i.e. like the little eyeball, there's a little FX box. Let's just blur it out. Click on that, and it blurs it back forth, back forth. And that does the blurring. But like I said, there's a lot of different blurs and a lot of overlap. The box blur I chose gave me one look. Radio blur gives me a different one. It actually makes it look like it's spinning. Yes, as we go in and out, in and out. Now the radio blur has a different option, many different little options here. One of which I should want to draw your attention to is and you're going to see this a lot in other filters, is this thing called center, or in some filters it's called position. And this is microscopic crosshairs here plus numbering. Right now, this radio blur is in the center of my screen. And that's that microscopic crosshair right there. And so hence, that's where the circle is. If I grab it and move it around, you can see that's a different crosshair than the crosshair of the layer itself. I can move this around and I can create a different center point or position of where the radial is happening. I can just as easily also move the numbers to the right and to the left. Remember it's X and Y, right, left, up, down. If you know exactly what you want, you can also type in exactly how far you want it to be. Now, sometimes it's almost next to impossible to grab that crosshair. Here's where this button next to the numbers comes in handy. If you click on it once, it actually shows you where the crosshairs there are and allows you to move it with your mouse to recenter it. Because when this crosshair is literally dead center, you can accidentally get into a different, grab the wrong one by mistake. And I just deleted it by mistake. There we go. So as you can see, <laughs> let's move the position, there we go. That's what I was trying to undo. So that is another blur type. And you can keep, like I said, you can go through all these. Just to let you know for the evening, I'm not planning on, and there's just no way on the planet, I could go through and cover every very single one of these uh, filters. Filters are gonna be talked about through the entire semester. So I'm going to show you some of the key concepts tonight on how the filters operate and some of the key th things you'll see in a lot of them, like that positioning or centering option. Okay, so I'm not moving the anchor point. I, could, I was moving the anchor point. Of course, it may have been also. Can you not see me moving that around? Ah. Yeah, technically it's called the center point for this filter, but other filters call it the position. It was really nice of them to like literally call the, the same thing, um, you know, dip by different names. So it's, that's kind of crazy making. Okay, we'll go ahead and delete that again. You know, for example, radial blur, and there's another radial blur. And you can see that this one actually is very similar to the Photoshop one. If you see a filter that has the same name as one that you recognize in Photoshop, it probably 
operates more or less the same way. Advantage of this one is it's drop down menu gives you the opposite between the spin, similar to the other one, to a zoom option, which really lets you. And also you can play with the center point as well with this to give you different ways of looking. Okay. And like I said, these blur options, which I was just grabbing from Blur and Sharpen, are also located on the right hand side. These are the exact same things. I delete one. All you have to do is take one of these and you can drag and drop it onto your the layer. And it does the exact same. Oops, that was the box blur. And to do the radio one. And you grab the right one. There you go. And that gives me those options there. Zoom in, zoom out. Okay. Any questions so far? Give you guys a few moments to type. It comes up. Keep in mind the, my chat's on a separate screen, which is to my side, so I'm not seeing, uh, looking at it constantly. Okay, don't see anything new popping up. Okay, I'm going to get rid of that one. I'm going to choose something new. I'm going to choose this world map blue. Drag and drop it here. As you can see, this is a simple JPEG. It's a map of the world. Okay, I just downloaded it off the internet and stuff. Now, the filter I'm going to use is one called CC Sphere. You'll notice that there's a lot of uh, filters called CC. Way back in the early days of Adobe, uh, there was a separate company. I can't remember what CC stands for any longer. Uh, Adobe bought them and then integrated their filters into After Effects. And they still call them CC, even though they have similar names. But I want to show you the CC sphere to give you an idea of uh, the power of what some of these filters can do. This one also has some really neat tools on it that you'll see, which you'll see elsewhere. So basically, all I'm going to do is grab the CC sphere, drag, drop it onto my layer, and watch. Bang. Would you look at that? I have made it a globe, just like on the evening news. Now in my left-hand side, my options, there's a options here for rotation. And under rotation, it breaks it down to X, Y, and Z. Okay. Now this throws people because everyone goes, well, Eric, X is right, left, as you've told us. Y is up, down. Z is actually forward backwards. So if you use any sort of 3D software or anything, these are the things you're going to see, X, Y, and Z. But this throws people because watch. So X is what, right, left? Watch what happens. Notice that my globe is going up, down, not right, left. My Y is supposed to be right, left, correct? Oh, wait. I mean, Y should be up, down, and then there's my right, left. And Z does a barrel roll. So when it comes to rotation, the X, Y, and Z are kind of oddly shaped. Because basically, here's what the situation is. Right now, you have to think of the X rotation as a line running through this globe from center to center right, right and left, so X. So when it spins, it spins around that line, hence it goes from North Pole to South Pole. With Y, there's a line running straight through the polar caps and it rotates like you think it should. And the Z has a line coming straight at the camera, therefore it spins like a pinwheel. All Adobe After Effects rotations are based on this concept of these lines magically going through. So think of them as pivot points, okay? So they're pivoting around the lines of the X, Y, and Z. So if I wanna rotate my globe like it would in a normal newscast, 
I just have to activate the Y. Move a few seconds down and say rotate three times. So my first keyframe is set to zero rotation and my final keyframe is set to uh, three. And now my globe spins around and around. I bet you thought those opening newscasts were took forever to do. And here it is, just a couple keyframes, and it goes around. Kind of neat, huh? Now the radius gives us exactly a size issue. We can make the globe bigger and smaller, of course. Quality of rendering. Lighting is what it sounds like in the sense that it's, we've created this false light here. We can move it to anywhere else on the planet if we want. Change the color of it. If you're doing an alien landscape, change the intensity. And of course, like I said, the direction I've already played with and stuff. By the way, in all these filters, if you accidentally screw it up and it's so bad you can't do anything with it, notice at the very top there's a button called reset. Just hit that, it'll set all these numbers back to their original space. But it will not delete your keyframes, thank goodness. And shading controls is obviously how this shades, which I'm not going to get into tonight. Now, normally at this time, I would then have you guys all play with this and make the uh, planets rotate or spin around, spin around, spin around. So not being able to do that, what do you guys think? Uh, any questions on this so far? And are you guys hearing me okay? Just wanna make sure. Yes, we got one, yes, all clear. Thank you very, very much. Okay. And we got, I think you guys can all see the chat. Yes, it's amazing how easy it is to make a globe. The answer is, yeah, it really is. It's mind blowing. This gives you an idea of the power of filters uh, within After Effects. Now, let me take this a step further. I'm going to delete this filter. Notice that the reason why the filter works so well is because I've got this white background with my blue lettering. Now, I also have a Photoshop file. I took the exact same image and I made this with a transparency. There is no white background. Now, if I put my sphere filter on here, notice that what it does, it actually rotates the actual physical transparency. So when I rotate this, I can actually see through the globe and see the backside of the planet. And the thing is actually rendering the shadowing and stuff from the opposite side which is just a different, very much different look and feel from the other way. It's not that it's right or wrong, it's just a different way to look. And I'm sure you've watched the evening news and you've seen both ways being done and stuff. The other thing on this one is what it's creating is what I refer to as a pseudo 3D. This looks like it's three dimensional, but it's not really. It's, uh, we do have three dimensionality in After Effects, but this one's not using those options. It's only making it look 3D. Now, the other problem with filters is we always jump to conclusions because a lot of times people go, wow, that sphere is amazingly powerful filter. What does it do with text? Well, that's a good question. So if I were to make some text here, oops. A little bigger than I need it. We welcome to college. So there's my text. Watch what happens when I put sphere on it. Yeah, 
notice that the sphere does exactly what it says because it literally pulled the lettering north and south besides wrapping it all the way around. So while this is very, very cool, it's not very readable. This gets back into one of my PowerPoint things I was saying earlier, which is not every filter does what you want it to do. If you can't find exactly the filter you want, there's probably one that's nearby to it. For example, There's also a CC cylinder. CC cylinder basically takes your text a little bit bigger, change the position. Oops, wrong one. So that's what I should do with. Okay, now I can cheat the rotation. CC cylinder, on the other hand, allows me to literally rotate because it's making an invisible cylinder and putting the wrapping the text around it. So therefore, I can now animate this. My rotation, go to the end, rotate three times. and stuff. And by changing the angle on the X, you can actually see the actual thing. Now I may just set that back to zero to let me, you can see I'm getting, and this is not the only way to make text go around in a circle. It is a way, but it's not the only way. So you can see there's a big difference between cylinder and sphere. The sphere worked great for the map, not so well for text. If I were to grab one of these photographs again, put cylinder on it, yeah, come on, grab it, there we go. It does the exact same thing. Rotate it around. The one thing about the photograph, of course, is when you get to the seam, between the left and right hand side, you can see there really is a hard line sitting there. But it is like rotating around. Shrink it down a little bit. Change the X rotation. And you can see there's my cylinder shape. Let me hide my text for a second here. There we go, cylinder shape. And around and around she goes. So it's very, you know, many, many, many options here. It's not limited to what you, you know, it's, you know, very, very interesting to what you can achieve. Now, again, I don't want to ra go racing too far ahead. Can I make the text go around the cylinder? That is a problem. This is where the 3D, pseudo 3D comes in. Is right now my cylinder and the text are not technically in 3D space. Okay. For the guy, I'm actually, since I'm learning how to do this too, Max asked the question on the chat Can you get the text cylinder? To look like it's wrapping around something else? The answer is yes, but we need to take a couple of extra steps. We actually need to convert these layers into 3D layers, which I'm not covering tonight, sorry. I know you, everyone wants to jump ahead, but I just can only cover so much in one evening. And um, you can actually hit look at, make it look like things are wrapping around each other. Okay, any other questions before I move on? Okay, thinking so far so good. So 
there are so many different filters. The other thing is when you can mix filters together. So for example, I can go into color correction and I can easily make this photographic image black and white, literally. And we also have the very center. Now, for example, I can also choose tint. Now, here's the interesting thing. Both tint and black and white are very similar to each other. But I can, for example, make like a sepia tone. There we go. So there's the tint being that little rusty brown. I also have the black and white filter. Notice that even though I have tint activated, the filters go from the top of the list to the bottom of the list. So basically it starts by tinting this image and then the next filter converts to the black and white. So these two are canceling each other out. So when you start mixing filters together, this is a very common thing you have to be aware of is they can cancel each other out. But also the stacking order. So for example, if I make this black and white and then put tint at the bottom, the image becomes black and white and then suddenly the tint puts the, makes the black and white this red color. So that's how you, you know, pay attention is you want to make sure that you have these in the right order to get the look and effect that you're trying for. And as always, you can just highlight the name, hit delete, go on to the next one. We also, for Photoshop fans, we of course have levels, which is your standard levels, just like in Photoshop. Like I said, there's gonna be a lot of overlap between the filters in Photoshop and After Effects. It makes sense because they're made by the same company. So from this, I can go in and adjust all my levels for brightness, contrast. So I can make the black blackers and the whites whiter. Just the same way I would do before, I can go in and individually control all of them together, just the red channel, green channel, blue channel, and we haven't talked about it yet, but the alpha channels, which there isn't one for this photograph, so therefore, I want to make things a little bit more redder. So, okay. Okay, gotcha, I missed that. Is that the response to Max uh, thing or response to my tinting of things, coloring? Okay. Okay, any other questions, anyone? Okay. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? Oops, I just clicked. Okay, wasn't sure. All right, basically uh, normally in classes, I have these handouts. I literally print these up and give them to you. They're step-by-step -step instructions. This is one I have called growing elements. Okay, this is not for a, a grade or anything. It is a step-by-step, -step, something for your reference to do. There's a special effect inside of, that you've seen a million times on TV shows and stuff where it looks like a artwork, piece of artwork is growing out of the ground. And we're going to use a filter to achieve that. And I've got a PowerPoint slide of this thing on the left-hand side already broken down into its various groups. Now, if you recall, let me just do a repeat of last week. If you do a file import, just like normal, you know, file, import, file, 
and you were to choose growing elements, it would import but flatten the image. In order to get all the layers from a Photoshop file or an Illustrator file, yeah, it's on Canvas right now, by the way. Um, but can I bring Canvas up to show you that? Yes, yeah. yeah, so if you go to Canvas, class hand, files, class handouts, you'll see that the growing elements is hiding in there. And you can see there's a lot more I'm giving out for the semester. But anyhow, uh, getting back to importing. Importing Photoshop files or Illustrator files, if you import it as footage, it's going to flatten the image. Sometimes you want that. It's not a bad thing. But if you want all the individual layers, you want to import it as a composition. What happens then is it makes a composition for you automatically and it lay, lines up all the layers the same order you had them in in Photoshop. Just same name, same everything, just imports them flat out. Okay, now before I go on and show you guys how to do this project, let me explain something. What we're about to do can be done in other methods, okay? There isn't, you know, there's like about three different ways to do what we're about to do. The reason why I'm showing you in this method is because this particular filter has built into it almost every other item you'll see in other filters. So it's a great way of learning about filters. Okay. I can't type. Okay. So with the handout, as it will say, you import it, gives you all the step by steps. Get to things, make you make the comp. Okay. Now the other thing that I recommend here is I'm going to make a new layer. There's more than one type of layer. Okay, for example, under layers, there's new. Oh, come on, there we go. Layer new. And you'll notice that there's text layers, solid layers, lighting, and we'll get into these other ones. One of the more common ones is called a solid layer. And a solid layer is what it sounds like. You can make it the same size as the comp. You can make it whatever color you want. Make this one new. Make it a light blue. That's for the heck of it. Say okay. Say okay. And right now it's the top layer, so I'll drag this to the bottom. Just so I happen to have my uh, something to view. If I choose, I can also do it transparency-wise, but we'll do it with this. All right. So now I have a solid layer just for contrast and viewability. Okay. The other thing that I recommend is you particularly practicing this is you want to do each layer individually. Do not try to do them all simultaneously <laughs> because that will drive you nuts. So I'm going to hit the little eyeballs, bring it down, and choose the one called base, which is just this little part here. I'm also going to lock down my background so I don't. Um, accidentally move it around. I can move the one layer, but I don't want to move the other one. And finally, I'm going to actually use the filter now. And it's actually, I'm going to do it from the pull down menu, pull down, generate, and we're going to use a one called right on. So I click on the base layer, effects, generate, toward the bottom, the very bottom, right on. The right on filter allows me to paint and animate, almost like finger painting. Now, the problem right now is the brush size is very, very small. So I'm going to make it really big so you can actually see it. We, there we go. You guys can see that now. So 25, 20, 20 or 25 would be do me the, do me the trick. Notice that this also has a thing called brush position, meaning that this brush point can actually move around and it can grab it. Once again, notice that the layer center and the brush on center are right on top of each other. So sometimes it's really hard. This is where I would actually have you guys practicing this and saying, if you can't grab it just right, hit the little button crosshairs and it will allow you to move it away from the center of the layer 
and it'll put it anywhere else. So now it doesn't matter what color you make your brush because it can technically be any color whatsoever. For example, I'm going to get red just so we have red, black, and blue. Now here's where it gets interesting. Notice that the brush position where it's located has a keyframe, has a stopwatch to make a keyframe. So if I click that, my brush is actually starting at the bottom of this black line. I'm going to move over about two seconds. And as I move it, it's actually drawing. And I'm intentionally trying to cover up and hide this black line. And you'll see why in just a minute. And then I got a little loop back here. So I'm just going to twist it. Oops, move the entire layer, undo that. Twist it and bring it back down. Because I want to hide that black line. And you'll see again in just a moment. But to play the animation, you can see that my little line is, so my red line is hiding my black line. If I want to, I can hit the letter U on my keyboard and see my keyframes. And if they're going too fast or too slow, I can adjust the speed of them by, you know, put, you know, adjusting where my little diamond shapes are and play with it that way. Now that doesn't look very excited, exciting, unless of course you're thinking of, uh, you know, drawing graffiti or something like that. However, this is where this knowing these things, knowing your filters come in handy. There are many other options here besides the position, the color, the brush size, brush hardness, the opacity, we can play with that, stroke length, et cetera. The real power of this filter comes in through the drop down menus, particularly the last one called paint style. Notice that it says paint style is on the original image, hence the red line is on top of the black image. But if I choose reveal the original image, my red line vanishes. That's why I said there was no problem about waiting for the uh, color. Because now watch what happens. Where my red line was, it's now literally drawing that black line. Now you've seen probably that special effect in a million title sequences, TV commercials and whatnot over the years. Now again, I want to emphasize that this filter is only one way of doing this. You'll, if you go online, look for this sort of thing, you'll probably see three other ways of doing this. And it's not that one's better than the other. Again, I'm teaching filters tonight. Therefore, this particular filter, all these options here are very common things that you'll see, such as position, color, sizes, and the various drop-down menus. There's a lot of really good hidden stuff under the filters drop-down menus. <coughs> excuse me for coughing. And no, I'm not sick. I'm just parched. Uh, okay, before I move on, any questions on that? Did that make sense to everybody? Yeah, masks are one way. There's other also a couple other filters. Let me just, loop, let me just sit here and loop this while I'm reading your uh, instruction, reading your comments and stuff. Yep, and if you'll notice, right there, and there's the handout, and it literally gives you the drop-down menu. So when you download this. Yeah, this is why we do this layer by layer, because the shape of the paint is different for each layer. So if I choose the next little bit here, which is exactly what I'm going to do, now, first things first is I could, you know, I'm going to go ahead and grab the, oops, I can't spell right. Right on filter again, drop it on top of the next one. Okay. So now I have what I call base one, which is this little itty bitty blip, the next line that's hitting. 
Now we're going, I'm going to make it also a big white. Now I'm intentionally making this choice of filter a different color from the other one, just so you can see that I'm on a different layer. And I sit here and I go, okay, now I'm going to get into some artistic side of things. Okay, for example, when do I want this line to start appearing? I don't want to start at the very beginning. What I really want is the artistic side of me says, when this black line hits that one right about there, and that's when I want this to start growing out of this other line. It'll just look more natural that way. So I can then adjust my next layer. I'll just position it down here. Keyframe the right on. Go down a few seconds. Move up on it. Because there's a bend, that's a short one, I'm just going to make another keyframe to give that natural bend. And once again, I use the drop down menu to make, reveal original. Now back the whole thing up. Now that starts a little bit late. So all I have to do is, whoops, select all those keyframes. I'm going to slide this over just a little bit more. That's looking a little bit better. Let's see how that plays out. And there we go. And then it's a process of continuing on with the next little bit. Now here's a cheater's way of doing things, by the way. I'm going to highlight the filter from the, the white one, from the one I just did under effects controls and go edit, copy, click on the next, that next one, and go paste. Now my thing is when it pastes, it gives me the exact same keyframes to the point of which actually they're exactly the same spot. So I actually need to kill these keyframes. But this is a faster way of so we'll put that right there. Back it off a little bit. Right. Start it right about there. Position. Two seconds. And I can just make this a straight shot. Reveal on original because there's no bend in it. So let's see how those th three go together. So you can see it's slowly coming together. Again, I can play with the speed of it and things like that, but I'm kind of digging the way that's going. Then of course I've got the next one, there's a little blip at the top and the leaf. I'm going to leave those two alone for the moment. Then we got the big tip. So the big tip at the top, I'm going to go ahead and paste on the filter again I'm going to go back to the original so I can see where this is. I'm also going to get rid of those keyframes for the moment. Now I have to make some decisions. When do I want that to start growing? So I'm going to start it right about there. This up so it's closer. Brush position. Now I'm going to go forward for a few seconds. It's a lot bendy on this one. More, more up, more. Let's bend in. So this white line is now covering that up. Reveal the original image. And now if I hit play, I can see
And I can probably speed up that upper tip. That's not a great distance going around the bend, but it's, it seems kind of slow. So it's, oops. A lot of what we're doing is just simply playing with this, you know, adjusting things as we go, you know, until we get something that looks good. Yeah, I like that a lot better. So all the instructions, like I said, are right here in this handout. So you guys can download it, download my file, you know, and it'll, like I said, it takes you straight through it. Doing the base one, base two. I do have an idea on the leaf layer and stuff, you know, in the sense of going backwards to the leaf. Just play it is that little leaf is kind of small. So what you can do with it, again, you want to find the right start position. Be right about there, I'm guessing. And I'm going to actually play, oops. Yeah, 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 I know I hit the wrong button. P for position, there we go. Is I'm going to actually mess around with the position here. I'm on the wrong layer, that's my problem. Okay, so there's my position and there's my scale. Actually, I'm going to play with the scale. That's what I want to do. I'm going to hit the little chain link so I can do these. But you'll notice that if I were to set these down to zero, zero, in theory, my leaf does not appear. But I can then grow my leaf for a few seconds. To make it look, actually that I'm not digging because you notice that's flying in. Not what I want to do. So again, there's a lot of trial and error in all, in all this. Oops, 3,000% no, 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 100%. For a few seconds. Hmm. <laughs> this is what I get for doing things on the fly. Not what I want. Therefore, Reset. <laughs> Which one we can just do it the other way as well. So easy. But it gives you guys an idea of how to do these things. Again, if we were doing this in class, I'd be having guys free form this and stuff. So what do you guys think so far? So far, so good? Any questions? Not seeing any questions. Do you guys want a quick break? See, yes, 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 on the break. Because actually this is a good place to give a court quick break. Okay. Uh, in answer to the question, does the image have to rasterize to use paint, the effect? Technically speaking, it's actually uh, a vector graphic. It only looks rasterized. It gets into that your monitors and viewing is bitmapped. So it will actually look very smooth uh, when you do it. Okay, I'm going to hit stop. Stop, stop share. Stop recording. Okay, I think about that time to get 
Go on, is everyone back again? Stuff. One of the questions was that was asked in the chat, if you don't have that open, is when you import a uh, Photoshop into the comp, how do you control the length? Well, you do it just like you would any other composition. Under composition settings, it sets the information there. Plus that you can change the size of it. For example, right now it's the same size as the original Photoshop file, but I could make this as easy as NTCSDV. I could play with the length too, but I'll leave that alone right at the moment. Which of course you can see immediately as the issue of my background doesn't match size wise. So I can just stretch that out. Now I've unlocked it and stuff. I also remembered what I was doing wrong with the leaf when I was trying to make that uh, appear well, without using the right on filter. Well, my problem with it was quite simply, I was playing with the scale, which is fine, except the scale is based on the anchor point, which is the center of the screen. So that's why it was just jumping all around. It's not where I want it to be. I've gotten to move this anchor point to the tip of the leaf where I want this to actually grow as opposed to way up here. Now there's two ways of doing this. Method one is simply use the anchor point settings. And then when I come down here, I'm gonna put my leaf there. I can even rotate that a little bit more. So now you can see that when I play with the scale settings, it actually looks correct. So I can now keyframe that. Scale that Move for a few seconds. Grab that out, move that a little bit bigger that way. See how that looks. That looks so much better, don't you think? Now the other way, I'm gonna hit reset now. Once again, my anchor point, zoom in, is way up here for the leaf, because it always positions it in the center of the thing, is way up here on my toolbar. There's the most bizarre looking tool over here. It's next to the little camera, next to my shape rectangle. It's called the pan behind tool. Notice it now says bracket anchor point, which is one of those things of, it didn't always say have that bracket anchor point. But what that does is it allows me to grab that and move the anchor point manually, which is a much faster way of doing things. Now I can set this down to what I want, zero. Now my thing will grow properly, come up, hit that. Looks like it's being spread out. Okay. And so on and so forth. One of the interesting things about this, of course, is the versatility. I actually had knew a guy who had made a whole mess. He had like a hundred of these little curly Q lines and stuff had a ton of layers, and then he would cut and paste them to make whatever he wanted to. So people would say, I need a tile that looks like this, and he would just grab what he needed and could do it really, really fast. But the same example is, for example, if I wanted more leaves, I just choose the leaf layer, go edit, duplicate, which long, not the pan behind tool, use the regular pointer tool. I can make that. Move the entire layer, or I could just move the keyframes. I could make a whole mess of leaves going here. Okay. 
So what do you guys think? That's a pretty cool effect, isn't it? And you've seen that a million times on TV shows and whatnot. Actually, I should have asked the first question when I first turned on my mic. Is everybody back? Or have you all gone off to watch the TV? <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, you're all watching TV. Not just kidding with you guys. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> okay. Now, I want to take a little divergence here. You can practice this on your own with the PDF that I have for you guys to download and stuff. Um, you know, it's a good thing. Also, the handout, download it. It's a good thing, reference point. Um, now, if you recall last week in class, I spent some time talking about the putting compositions inside compositions and how we do that to group things together. Now, sometimes you can organize this intentionally in the sense of you make a whole mess of comps, do your animation on them and pull them all together. Sometimes you have to do it the other way around. For example, say I wanna group all these together except for my blue base. I want to group these all together so I can actually rearrange them and stuff. I can simply select all my layers go to layer, and the process is called pre-compositioning. It gives me a pop-out menu, which actually showed up on my other monitor, there it is. And I would say, you know, growing. So this is my, it's going to make me a new composition. So what's going to do is it's going to take all these layers here and shove them into this composition for me so I can do this on the fly. And one of the options is, of course, is move all those layers into this one, which is fine. And then hit OK. Notice it shrinks down my timeline. There's just one layer now. And my original information is still here, minus the blue background because I didn't choose it. But this gives me a great advantage. It means that I can take this grouped together information, I can duplicate it. And now I have two of them. And I can duplicate it again, and I can make three of them. So now I very quickly have made a animation Now, because these are all copies of the original, I can also uh, alternate them. For example, I can play with them. Make that one 90 degrees. Oops, because they're all selected, they all did it. If you select 90 degrees, 90 degrees. So I can make one here. Grab this other one, put this here. This other one, put it over here, and then duplicate that one again. And basically make a little frame like so. And I've made myself a little thing, put some text in the center there, and I'm good to go. Growing today, garden today. There is several ways, and the question in the, in the chat is, how do you reflect objects? Let's start with this one here. Several ways of doing it. One is there actually is a filter called flip-flop, but the faster way is actually play with the positioning. Notice that I'm playing with the scale. I'm just dragging it from one way to the other way. Now I flip that one, grab that one. Yeah, no, but I probably would want to flop that the other way too, right? Yeah, there, like so. You can see the advantage of grouping these things together. Jeffrey, did that answer your question?
Now I'm going to delete those duplications because I'm just going to duplicate them again. Let's grab this guy here. I think my wife here is going to hit reset. Okay, I'm going to play with the anchor point again, and I'm going to use the pan behind tool. I'm going to put the anchor point right at the very tippy tip. And now I'm going to scale this down. Move it again. Long tool, pointer tool, there we go. Okay, so I've got this, and I've made my anchor point position and scale roughly to what I want. So now I can hit duplicate. Choose rotation, 90 degrees. Duplicate again, R for rotation, 180. Duplicate again. Oops, I hit the wrong number on my keyboard, but I'll manually. Now I've got a beautiful little pattern going out from the center. And all I had to do was hit a few, you know, do duplicate a few times. And I've got my wonderful position there. Now, if I wanted to take this a step further, I could select all four of those, hit duplicate, hit rotate, put them a little off axes. And now I've got this, let's deselect everything so I don't see the little handles. And all that is from the original source. Now the neat process of grouping these things together is if I go back to the original and make any changes, now I'm going to make a really stupid change. I'm just going to put a blue square here. You'll see that that blue square actually ends up duplicated throughout the entire thing. So each one of these copies is pulling from the original, but I rotated each one individually. Therefore, it, uh, you can still play with individual layers while grabbing information from the, as a matter of fact, if I had been a little bit more careful, I could have really made that blue square into a nice diamond shape and done some more fancy things with it. But you can see how you can quickly make a complex pattern by just making a small portion of it and just duplicating the heck out of it. What do you guys think of that? Does that uh, seem cool to you? <laughs> yeah, hypnotic Yeah, when I do these circular patterns. But again, it gets into that, you know, <sighs> shortcuts really saves your time and energy. You definitely want to always uh, think of ways to trying to streamline your processes and stuff. So it really does come alive. Okay. Could I further, okay, Max asks, can I further group them into another composition? Sure. You know, I could, by the way, I'm going to go back to the original, get rid of that blue triangle for a second. I could just as easily select all the layers, go layer pre-composition. Call this one group of eight. Now I have group of eight. I can play with the scale of that. Maybe that's a little too small. Duplicate it. Both of those, duplicate both of those. And let's put one in the center, I'll just deselect. And now I've got five copies of the group of eights, which is based on our original file. Now again, these new compositions, which are copies of the original, 
are independent of each other. So for example, my lower right hand corner one there, I could easily go into my effects, color correction, choose, I don't know, tint. I'll make the black, that one red. Copy that. Next one. Oops, I accidentally put it on. Same one. Copy tint, go to the next layer, hit paste. Change that one to say blue. Paste them there, change that one to green. And then finally we'll go all the way down to this one. Paste in there. Make it yellow. Should maybe select the whole thing. Now you can see all those different co colors and stuff, but my original is still the black one, which is back to this original file. So this original file goes into the one big group, which is duplicated a whole mess of times, which is again then growing into this final one, which has that all duplicated again, and then a filter on each one of them to give it a different layer. So it's a big organizational tree. As a matter of fact, it likes to do things. There actually is a flow chart here, which you can see the growing elements goes into all these things, which goes into this one. Which So here's my original Photoshop files, which goes into the growing group. The growing group is duplicated, which goes into group of eight, which goes into this, which is tinted. I don't expect you to memorize this, by the way. You bring that up, by the way, by the little organizational chart icon down here. Some things get so complicated, you really need to build this thing to sit there and go, okay, where's my original thing coming from? Yeah, so, but you can see there is literally my Photoshop file, which goes into each one of these layers. There's my write on effect for, these, for this guy. All that goes into my growing group which then it was duplicated eight times, which goes into my group of eight, which then goes into, with tinted, into my final of the growing elements, tools all together. And we get pretty little pictures when we're all said and done. So by pre-composing and grouping things together, it gives us the power to duplicate things much further and to do some really fun things as you've seen. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Don't see anybody chiming in there. So I'm just gonna go composition, new composition. You can also see this is why it's important to name your compositions. Otherwise, it's going to drag you nuts to keep, tell these things apart. Because when you look at these things, you know, it's like, at least now, you know, growing group is all of them together. Elements is the one-on-one. -on -one. This goes into the eight, which goes into this and stuff. But yeah, what I want to do is I want to come in here, I'm going to grab some video because it's important to know, whoops, no, 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 other stupid computer, go the other way. Okay, so I've got some video, which is much longer than my 20 seconds. So I'm just going to trim off my working area. Okay. The reason why I wanted to show this, come on, scale, there we go, is of course that the filters, even though we've been doing uh, images, steady images, video does work. So for example, if I were to put a blur on this, my box blur. <clears throat> You'll see that, yeah, yeah, hit play. I did hit play. Yeah, that's a little too much of a blur. Let's try 25%. There we go. Now the computer does 
show the video. So you do, uh, you know, anything you can do with still images works for video just as well. However, it does, of course, let's go vertical with that, slow down the processing time. Because think about it, it's got to move all these pixels 30 times a second in order to generate this image on your screen. Now, one of the things I want to bring up at this point is the moment you start adding more and more filters to your timeline, it's going to slow down your process. There just is no way around it, unfortunately. So when it comes time to do rendering and stuff, it's got to give more time for it. For those of you who've been trying to export out your first projects, uh, you will have discovered that, you know, it took a few minutes, but once we start adding filters, it's going to add extra time to it once again. So there we go. There's a blur filter onto our video. And stuff. There are filters for every effect that you can possibly think of. Some of them for things you never even thought about. Okay. Bubbles. Now bubbles, I just brought that up to point out something very interesting. Some of these filters delete the information that's your layer. Yeah, something to be aware of. Because you may sit there and go, I want bubbles on top of my waterfall. And you put bubbles onto that layer. You go, whoops, where did my video go? Unfortunately, that is the problem with something like that. So our solution quite simply is to put a solid. Remember at the beginning, I told you, you know, there's many types of layers. So we go layer, new, solid. Again, it doesn't matter what color it is. Why? Because the bubbles is going to delete it. And we just go effects, generate. Where do my bubbles go? You can tell which side I use, CC bubbles, there we go. Now, I get the, because it hid the, the solid from view, I now get bubbles through the two layers. Why are these red? Because my solid was red. If I need to change that, I can just go into layers, solid settings, change this to blue bubbles. Or do I want light blue? I'll get into the different types of layers in just a moment. Give me a second, Julian. But there you go. So some of these filters must be, like I said, rule one, all filters must be on a layer. The other thing to watch out for is to Sometimes these filters will delete the contents of the layer. Okay, now, okay, let me answer some questions real fast. The answer is, yeah, we use solid layers a lot. We use them for backgrounds, but we also use them for this purpose expressly. Now, somebody asked what a null layer is. Null layers is what's referred to as a null object. A null object is a non-rendering layer, literally. It makes this little black box and people always go, Eric, that's silly. Why would I care? But I'm going to hide this and watch what happens. If I put CC bubbles onto it, literally nothing happens. Because a null layer will not accept a filter. Okay, we use null layers for other purposes. I will cover them down the road. Okay, but basically for filters, null layers are null. Okay, because it doesn't render out. That's the real reason. We, the, uh, just briefly, just because keep it, is a null layer is often used when we do that parenting thing. So we can animate one thing and then have all the layers follow this little box around. That's one of the purposes for a null layer. The other type of, um, now I'm going to make, let me make one more solid, just so I, oops, camera, I don't want to make that. You'll see that in two weeks, okay. Um, I want to make another solid. I'm going to change the color just so I can tell the difference. Okay. I'm going to make that the background. And I'm going to make my, do somebody a little bit smaller. And I missed my scale. There we go. Okay. All right. So, 
So you can see I've got three layers. I've got my video, I've got my background, I've got my bubbles. The other type of um, layer that you can use with filters is what's known as an adjustment layer. So layer new adjustment layer. An adjustment layer is a unique layer. So for example, I'm going to choose tint. Remember tint makes everything a different color. So let me get, uh, no, not yellow. That makes us all look sick. Let's try a rust sepia tone. Okay. So this adjustment layer has this tint filter on it. The way adjustment layers work, by the way, is it does everything below it. So if the adjustment layer is the topmost layer, there we go, is the topmost layer, it impacts all the layers. Now I'm going to move the adjustment layer down below my bubbles and watch what happens. The bubbles become blue again and only my video and my green background are the ones impacted. If I use my adjustment layer again, move it down. Now my video is fine and only the green background. If I put it to the very bottom, there's nothing below it, therefore it's not impacting it. So the two most common layer types that we use with filters are solids and the adjustment layer. And obviously, you know, layers themselves. I mean, for example, the, uh, you know, for artwork. The only time we need to use a solid f is for the filters that literally remove the content. Okay. Now the layers we'll get into more detail as the semester goes on. Don't worry about lighting and camera just yet. We'll get back into that. By the way, shape layer is the same thing as our little rectangles here. And text, of course, is using the big letter T to put in text. Don't make that. Don't make it stand out a little bit more. Just nice bold Arial there. So there's our text layer. And yes, you can put filters onto the text layer just as easily as you can put them on uh, your uh, other filters. So for example, I can of course put a you know, blur, do a radial blur this time onto my thing. But notice what happens also is it's limited to just the size of the text. It doesn't go anywhere beyond because there is no other information and it can only impact that information. Okay, does that answer the questions between null objects, solids, and adjustment layers real quickly? Am I testing you on, no, solid is not the same thing as a shape layer although you can use them sometimes for the same thing. A shape layer literally is a shape, such as the rectangle star polygon, like we've done before. Oops, and I made a mask. Why? Because that was chosen. If I deselect that, now if I make a star. There's my star. There's a shape layer. The solid itself is always a rectangular in shape. However, you can, like I said, make it any rectangle and you can animate it. You can play with the scale and stuff and do what I'm doing there. So yes, do not confuse a solid with a shape layer. Okay. You can see how many layers I got on the sun of a gun. Interesting stuff. Okay, any other questions? I know I'm giving you a lot of information to digest and I'm just hoping the cloud system is actually recording this 
so you guys can that was the one thing i didn't get a chance to test today when i finally got access to all this information we're uh at the teacher, teachers meeting friday we were a little concerned that we may overwhelm them with disk space and hopefully they won't randomly start deleting stuff as for how do you access these things i'm not sure yet as soon as i figure that out i'll let you know etc So any other questions, guys? How are you doing? Hmm. Going back to my video here. This is the one of the um, interesting things about uh, doing this online is normally I have um, only uh, I have you give you guys time to practice this, which I um, um, obviously we don't do online. So we're going through this material much faster. Okay, two questions. Max says project two going to be all about filters. Uh, no, it's going to be making another little movie a much shorter one than the one you just turned in. And can you limit adjustment layers to affect only one layer? The answer is only if it's the second to last one, okay? If you only want to impact one layer, it either has to be a solid or it has to be uh, part of the original layer. Keep in mind, not all the uh, filters delete the contents, okay? So not every single filter that we have here, such as CC bubbles, which deleted out our bubbles is going to do that. A lot of these other filters will, of course, you know, work just fine on the layer that's on. There gets to be a lot of, you know, different looks and feels. And I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of these uh, filters, even, you know, I sit there and go, interesting, I have no clue why we would uh, use this and stuff such as this one called cartoon, which just fills in the lines and stuff. It does, you know, gives you a different. Different look there. Yes, the answer is also, as Jillian said, is Hey there, I just accidentally unplugged my, hold on. I just accidentally unplugged my microphone. My apologies, everyone. Uh, as I just caught my chair arm. Okay, can you drag effects on and off an adjustment layer and onto the layer you want to limit? The answer is yes. You can drag any effect, you know, from here. Where's my bubbles? shape layer, there's my text layer. There it is, you can grab any one of these and you know, take it off and on, cut and paste it. Uh, you can work around the, ins the issue by pr making a new composition, adding more and adjusting as you go. There's just so many different ways of mixing and matching these things uh, that yeah, pre-comping is a very valuable way to go sometimes you get into these weird, uh, th there's no one right answer. It'll be different visually speaking. But those are good ways of thinking about things is I need a pre-comp pre like two or three layers so I can add one filter to all of them and impact it that way. As we build more and more complicated uh, timelines, you'll start getting the hang of these sort of things. And I'll be honest with you, professionally speaking, a lot of this is a lot of trial and error as well. You know, there is no one right answer. You know, it's, one of, it's like one of those things where I showed you originally, how many of the, these blurs are almost identical to each other for all intents and purposes? Which one's better than the other one? The answer is it isn't. It just gets into an artistic choice on your part. Is there a way of rasterizing? The answer is no. 
Okay. The only way you can join layers together is to pre-comp them, pre-compose them and stuff. The only other way to doing that, Max, and for everybody in the class is you can export out the layers, make a quick time movie, and then bring it back in and put it back into your timeline. Okay. That's not necessarily a recommended way of doing it, but it can be done. You do have to be careful because if you do uh, choose to compress it, you'll start losing quality as you go, if you go that direction. Okay, any other questions and stuff? Now keep in mind, I've got some time set aside down the road in these semesters uh, to talk about some of these more complicated, because like I said, some of these filters are, it takes me an entire evening just to go through all the things you can do with them. Some of them are complicated just because they have way too many options. For example, we have one here called lightning, which literally is a bolt of lightning. Matter of fact, that's a little too hard to see. So let me hit delete here. There is lightning. Look at all these options that we have. I mean, we can change the color of the center. If I showed this to you the first evening of class, you guys would probably go running away on me because there's just way too many choices and stuff. But the good news is even with complicated filters like this one, don't panic. You don't have to play with every setting. Almost every single one, the default settings will do a lot of things you want to do. And the naming of these options are pretty straightforward, you know, such as turbulence, you know, how many more, for, you know, forking, decay, and things like this. So you just read the name and decide what you want to try to do to change it. You know, don't There's a better view of the lightning. And by the way, you can use this lightning to have come out people's fingertips. The wizard is shooting somebody or is a force lightning for you Star Wars fans out there. And once again, notice that all these are key frameable. That's the real power of the fil filters is, is that these things are so easy to animate. And they're also a great time sink in the sense of um, you can spend hours fiddling with these things. In this point of time when you're doing projects and stuff, you gotta move on saying that's what I want onto the next part so I can finish this on time and stuff. Okay, I don't wanna go racing ahead too much, but what are you guys thinking? Doing okay? Definitely going to use that lightning. Yeah, it's a popular one. What can I say? Uh, before I move on, I should point out one thing about the lightning, um, which is the first ones at the top here. Is origin point is the top of the lightning. So you can actually move it around. And then direction is the lower point here, which way it's going. So if you have it shooting out of somebody's fingertips, you want to put the origin point on the fingertip, and then you obviously want to put the direction to the target that it's hitting. Now, by default, by the way, the interesting thing about lightning is it doesn't animate. When I hit play, notice it doesn't do anything. I actually have to keyframe either the origin or the direction. to 
to actually achieve motion. So that there's some crinkling between them. It wants animation of motion for lightning. And the more I move this, the more dramatic the uh, changes would become. Back it off here. Now, the other question I often get with lightning, which is, yes, is a very popular filter, is how do you make a lightning strike but only appear for a split second? Because that's the most common thing for lightning is lightning will fall down from the ground, you know, from the sky down to the ground, like so. And I want it to strike. So the first thing I would do is keyframe the, the directional point, which is the guy down here at the bottom. That's right there, actually. I move over a few frames and I get it to move. Notice how close together my keyframes are. So let me sit there and go, strike. Okay, so far so good. That gives me my strike. Now I just have to trim. Remember my brackets, alt bracket. Alt bracket right, alt bracket left. Now this tiny bit of information on my timeline is when the lightning will appear. I could actually shrink it down even more. So if I were to put something in the background, let's choose a nice sunset. Now watch what happens. Yep, it goes by just that fast. It's complete lightning strike. So this is it goes. Maybe I want it on the screen a little bit longer. A little unrealistic, but I can make it longer. But by only having this image on the screen a very short time period, it allows you to make a split second appearance. I mean, you could zoom in all the way and get it down to frame by frame if you really, really wanted to. Of course, then you could also duplicate that layer Have the next one appear a little bit. Oops. Farther down the timeline. Lightning strike. Wait, 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 and then another. Now there's no randomization for the lightning. Sorry to say that. It would be less work. Although I'm going to now delete what I just did. There is a leftover. Okay, I'm going back to that blue solid again. This full size again. Under effects, you'll notice that there's a thing called obsolete. They actually have another lightning under obsolete. This is the old one from old versions. And the funny thing about it was it was already pre-animated. <laughs> So even though uh, it's obsolete, it's still one of those tools we sometimes go to to, to do lightning because it just sits there between the start point and end point and generates out which point you can then increase the branching, the angles, craziness. This is how I do power plants and stuff or crazy sci-fi stuff. So advanced lightning or this lightning are two ways of going that route. Some of the obsolete ones are still, you know, pretty useful from time to time. And this does have a randomization option under it. Well, I'll just play with it some more. And to mention the various color choices. Okay, what do you guys think of that? So we also 
use a blend mode. I add it, let's go dark. Nah, too dark. There we go. We can still see the photograph underneath it. Always cool and fun stuff. Okay, everybody, start thinking about your questions and whatnot. There's a whole host of wonderful filters under distort, which does exactly what it sounds like. And some of these you may even rec recognize from Photoshop, such as the liquify command, which allows you to get in there and change all the tools. And of course, yeah, you can keyframe this and make this an, into an animation. And stuff. Reset that. And yes, it works on the video just as well. So if I were to go back to my Yosemite video. Choose liquify from that. There we go. <laughs> There's a heck of a distortion, right? Let's play with it a little bit more. Now, when you think about what I just did there to this Im poor image, come on, play. There we go. Is think about the processing power it's taking. This is a home computer, for goodness sakes. And it's moving every pixel. I mean, that's a lot of processing power going into this. But very cool stuff. I do recommend just literally um, sometimes just putting a photograph on this thing and just playing with this. There's a kaleidoscope one. And that works good with the video. Flow motion. Honestly, some of these I've never used professionally, but they're cool to look at and stuff. Ripple. I make a water ripple. Don't feel bad if you don't have this memorized. I'm not, there's no, going to be no pop quiz for these. I'm just going through these and showing them to you just so you can have some fun. So I can make, a fish, make it look like a fisheye lens. What's really cool with that one would be to then create a mask, roughly about the same size of it. Let's make it. Silly little things like that. By the way, if you do fall into some of the more complicated uh, filters and stuff, and you can't figure out how, it, how to make it work, don't feel bad. There's times even I have to sit there and go, 
wait, how do you do that again? You know. Well, there's a nice distortion, really a warp. I'm turning it inside itself. But again, it's actually playing the video backwards on this backside, if you think about it. That's impressive in my book. If you want to do a manual page turning effect, there you go. Some of these, again, you probably will never use, such as 3D glasses and things like that, et cetera. All the simulations will nine times out of 10 wipe out your um, video. There's one that doesn't. Look, little rain puddles on your video. Yeah. Next question from Max was, can you show us some of the filters you've used a lot professionally? Actually, the ones I've used a lot are the ones that take one evening to cover. So I will be talking about them. However, even the simple one like raindrops and things like that, I've used this one professionally to make it look like it's literally raining outside when it's not, not and stuff. What you'll discover, by the way, everybody, is that you don't use a filter. Use combinations of filter in order to be able to, um, you know, achieve the look and feel that you're trying to do. Also, the cable, the mic is wrapped around the chair again. I'm trying to figure out a way to fix that without knocking everything over and stuff. But um, yeah, lots of fun things. Okay. Time to start thinking about your questions, guys. I'm getting into the running into a situation of, you know, I can show you more random things, but I'm running out of material. Like I said, normally, you know, we spend like an hour or so uh, practicing in the lab. So it's going to take me some adjustments to get this going. <laughs> and stuff. Stop recording for a second. <laughs> 